Okay, if you have your Bible, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. If you got Psalms and Proverbs, and then the next book is Ecclesiastes. Okay, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 11. It says, The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Lord, it's a blessing just to be able to pray and talk to you about these things tonight. And um, Lord, uh, help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we've been looking at this whole thing on the family and all that stuff, um, one, of the, one of the thoughts that came to mind was here. In Ecclesiastes 12, 11, it says the words of the wise are as goads. A goad is a sharp pointed stick, usually a pretty, pretty fair size, pretty lengthy staff. Uh, you know, you read in the book of Judges that um, Shamgar um, took an ox goad and killed 800 people with that ox goad. Now, of course, you know, that was supernatural. That was the hand of almighty God to be able to kill armed men with nothing but an ox goad. And, um, but, but an ox goad, uh, that the two words sort of speak for itself. The, it's a big sharp stick. And the purpose of it was um, to keep the ox moving. Uh, one, of the, one of the commentators from long, long ago said, um, uh, goads were used to poke the ox as it drove the plow. And it would cause him to move forward when he got pokey, when he got slow. Uh, if the ox got uh, lazy, started dragging, the, the, the goad would be used to keep that ox moving. Um, he, said, he said that the truth of God is said to prick men to the heart. And he quotes Acts 2, verse 37. Um, uh, the Lord spoke to Saul and said, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And um, Matthew Henry said that when we trifle with things that we know are true and when we start to um, just get careless, he said, the ox goad, he said, that goad of the truth will help us to once again use more vigor in our work. He said, while our good affections are so apt to grow flat and cold, we have need of goads. The verse says, the words of the wise are as goads. They, they poke you. And it says, and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies. The thought of a nail, and again, I'm quoting some of the, uh, one of the old commentators he said the thought of a nail is something that is driven and it sticks. Uh, it's interesting, the wording, it's by the master of an assembly. So, you know, be not many masters, knowing that we should receive the greater condemnation. It's the thought of someone teaching an assembly. So it's a picture of the church. And he said the, the words of the wise are like goads and they're like nails that are fastened by those leading that assembly. He said they are as nails uh, and it's meant to cause us to stick and to cause the truth to stick so that we are not wavering and it helps to fix in our mind that which is good. The Bible talks of a nail fastened in a sure place. It says the purpose of this 
Truth is that it, and being like a nail, is that it might be impressed and fastened in our mind. And he said, of course, the word of God is like a hammer. So it drives the nail. You know, some of these, some of these truths we're looking at, you know, um, they are, um, you know, God gives us a lot of truth about a lot of things. And he lets us hear things to, you know, sometimes to encourage us, sometimes to lift us out of our despondency, sometimes to counteract the voice of the devil, and sometimes to prod us on our way. Um, one of the things that you will hear sometimes that people say is, um, uh, and I, I want you to stick with me for a minute because this is really going somewhere. Um, you'll hear somebody say, and, and it can be innocently said, and sometimes maybe there's a little bit of truth to it, but usually it's said wrongfully. And that is, well, if you treat them like adults, they'll act like adults. That is usually said by an adult that is permissive and critical of strict supervision. That same person who would make that statement believes that mistakes will be made and that everyone makes mistakes and that they, usually regarding the young people, will learn from their mistakes and that's just part of growing up. But there is a problem with learning from your mistakes, as most of us know. The problem with learning from your mistakes is that by the time you really learn from your mistakes, it is often too late to benefit from that knowledge. You've already made some horrible mistakes. You're usually pretty scarred. And then you say, wow, I shouldn't have done that. Well, you know, that's not going to help you now. Experience is not the best teacher. Yes, you never forget what you learn by experience, but you are often crippled and devastated and scarred for life in the process. You are often bankrupted emotionally, morally, and sometimes physically. You suffer horrible losses by learning, by experience. You know what God's plan is? And, and for all of us. You know what God's plan is? Do you know what God's way is? You know, there's man's way. And a lot of these, these ideas, you know, even well-meaning and even sounding good, but they're man's way. They're not God's way. My ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. When? When will we learn that? God's way is that we learn by instruction and not by experience. And I want you to look at just a few verses real quick. Uh, turn to Proverbs 4. And man, I've got a string of verses on this one. But, you know, we're just going to fly through several and then you'll get the idea. Proverbs 4, verse 1. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father and attend it means pay attention to no understanding look at verse 13 take fast hold that means when you get a hold of it you grip it with a death grip take fast hold of instruction let her not go keep her for she is thy life 
Look at Proverbs chapter 6. It's interesting. The wisest man that ever lived outside of Jesus Christ, and there's just some few themes in the book of Proverbs. He just, I mean, it's just over and over. He just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back. Proverbs 6, verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Look at Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8, verse 10. Receive my instruction and not silver. He said, if you got to make a choice between money and good instruction, he said, you better take the instruction. Because that money is going to disappear real quick. Proverbs 8, verse 10. Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. Look at verse 33. Verse 33. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Look at Proverbs 9, verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. And, and we could just keep going through the book of Proverbs. Um, you know what God's God's way is, is that we now we're talking about moral lessons. OK, I realize if you're on the job and you're going to learn, you know, we got a machinist here. We got a drywaller. We got, uh, you know, air conditioning. We, we got we got all sorts of stuff in here. Um, you know what? If, sure, of course. But but even that. Even that experience is based on instruction. But he is talking about the moral things in life. Um, you know, I came across a quote many years ago, and it went something like this. In the Garden of Eden, before the fall, you remember when everything was perfect? Before the fall, God's plan was that man would know evil from the height of good. But man sinned. And when man sinned, everything was turned upside down. That's what sin always does. It turns everything upside down. And from that day forward, man could still understand what good was, but he perceived it from the depths of evil. It is God's plan. It is God's best. It is God's plan A that we learn by instruction and not by experience. You know, uh, you get into the book of Genesis and you get along about chapter 36. And uh, it's an interesting story. I'm sure many of you have read it probably multiple times. But in light of what we're talking about tonight, if you get a chance when you go home, uh, look at, I think it's Genesis 36. It's the story of Dinah. And Dinah was one of, uh, it was Jacob's daughter. Jacob had 12 sons and he had Dinah. And that chapter opens up with these words. And Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land. She just thought, I wonder what all these heathen folk are like. And, you know, there's some things when God relays some of these stories that he there's some details he doesn't give us. So you think, what was going on here? Why did this come about? Where, where was Jacob? What was going on here? But she wanders off. She's apparently a very attractive young woman, young. She wanders off to just see what life is like on the other side of the fence. She's not going there because she has an intention of parting. She probably doesn't even know what that is. And before that chapter is out, a young man, probably very handsome, very likable, he takes her and he lays with her. In the Bible, when a woman got grabbed and she was forced or raped, um, if she screamed, if she screamed for help, if she was an unwilling participant, um, you know, as far as God was concerned, she was off the hook. But if she didn't scream out for help, she was as guilty as he was. 
You don't find in this story that um, she put up a whole lot of resistance. And before that chapter's out, it's just full-blown, all-out tragedy. And where did it start? You know, maybe she maybe she'd heard. You know, you need to stay away from them. You need to stay away from them people. But she just thought, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if I want to listen to that instruction. I think I'll just find out for myself. And that usually ends in tragedy. Look at Romans sixteen. Romans 16, look at Romans 16, verse 19. Boy, there's an interesting phrase here. Romans 16, verse 19, Paul says, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. And then he adds a word of instruction. There's a colon there, and a colon usually signifies pay attention to what follows. And it says, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. The thought of simple is uh, often the thought of naive, uh, uh, not, not, not in the know. Uh, he said, I would have you wise concerning evil that which is good and simple concerning that which is evil. Now, you guys have heard this. Uh, it's been told many times. I'm sure most of you have heard this. Um, uh, quite, a, quite a number of years ago, there was a missionary lady, and uh, she told the story about uh, when she was in Bible school. And she, she said she, they would go over to the tribes. where she, Her name was, they called her on the mission field, they called her Mama Laird. And she went over to... Uh, to somewhere in Africa, and um, and she said they warned the missionaries. She said they warned them not to let their curiosity get the best of them. The missionary were warned that there would be satanic rituals. There would be things that would go on. And they said, don't have that curiosity that says, well, I want to find out what's going on so I can understand it. She said more than one missionary had come off the field in a straitjacket. That's, you know, when you lose your mind and you're, you're, you're out of control. And, and uh, I don't even know if they still use those things, but they would put them in what's called a straitjacket and it would prevent them from harming themselves or harming anybody else. That's what, that's when they totally lost their mind. And he said, because some missionary tried to film or record a satanic ritual in progress. You remember in the book of Acts, do you not? The seven sons of Sceva, a vagabond exorcist, and they tried to call the name of, of, of uh, uh, Jesus over this, over this demon-possessed man. And, and the, the demon spoke up and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And, and it says, the devil in that man overcame seven men, and they fled naked and wounded. Um, she said, um, in that same vein, she said they were taught that, okay, at least it used to be this way. I don't know how it's done now. But at the time she wrote the book, she said they would train people uh, that were into spotting counterfeit money. 
And she said, it wasn't like you, you thought it would be. She said they would take them into a room and, you know, for seven or eight weeks straight, they would, they never showed them a counterfeit dollar bill. She said they would literally school them about real money and every detail of real money. And she says for hours and hours and hours a day, all they handled was real, true money. And she said, suddenly, when you handed them a counterfeit, she said, they could instantly spot it. She said, they were, they did not study about all the counterfeits. Because you know what? The counterfeits are always changing. Had a friend of mine, and uh, he was, um, he's an evangelist now, but in his early days, he was a youth leader. And, um, and he said, this you know how it is, you know, uh, there's always a new movie coming out. And he said there was this really bad one that came out. It was really bad then, and it would still be really bad now. But the catch is, of course, now, you know, they've gotten the place where they can go several layers past the way it used to be. And um, but he said, at any rate, he said this new movie come out and, and uh, it was rated R. And he said it was really, you know, bad. And it was it was witchcraft and murder and everything in that that movie. And he said, um, he said he found out it, this guy was youth leader, but it was a large church. They had a large youth group. I, I saw that youth group. I was in that. Uh, I, I worked as a worker, a helper in that youth group for a little while. They had they had 150 kids in that youth group. And I don't mean from, you know, K4 to I, we're talking all of them teenagers. And he said, so they had several youth helpers that and, and they, they were all young adults. And he said he got wind that one of the youth workers was going to go to the theater to see this movie. And he pulled him aside and, um, and he said, uh, what are you doing? And he said, well, well, so-and-so, he said, I figure, you know, I need to go see it so I can, so I can understand it. So I can preach against it. And he said this, he said, well, I hope you never have to do any research on sodomy. He said, you know, you don't have to stick your head in a garbage can to understand that garbage is nasty. You don't have to do that. You know what that is? That's just the flesh. And it just wants to, it just wants to probe where it's not supposed to be. And it wants to make it sound spiritual. The Lord said, I would. That you were wise. He said, I, I wish you'd study the real and the true till you knew it forwards and backwards, like those dollar bills. And he said, I just assumed that you really didn't know much about evil. Why is that? Because then the first time it flies in your face, you recoil. It's shocking. It's embarrassing. You're not hardened. You're not calloused. You're not drawn to it. You're not playing with it. You go, oh my word, what is this? See, the problem where we are is a bunch of it's lost its shock value. You know why? Where, you know, the young people today, they just got a lot of experience. Look at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2. Boy, what an interesting passage, Revelation 2. And um, look at verse 18. And he writes to the church at Thyatira. In Revelation 2, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. There were some good things there. But boy, there was some serious rot. Look at verse 20. Notwithstanding, he says, notwithstanding means in spite of all this. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest, that woman Jezebel. In other words, he said, you're allowing something. 
Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophet, prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. This woman in the church there, she called herself a prophetess. She 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 paraded herself as this ultra spiritual. She was God's gift to the place, and she was going to enlighten people. And what she was doing, she was leading people into immorality and to other things. And she was somehow making it sound okay. Verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your deeds, unto your works. Now watch verse 24. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. He's saying now, uh, He's saying, I'm, I'm writing to you folks. And I says, for some of you, he says, as I write this letter, he says, it's too late. He said, some of you, you've already engaged in adultery with this prophetess. And he called it the depths of Satan. You know what? They had, they had, they had went across that line. They had probed. They had let their curiosity lead them. And and now they were, wow, they were experienced. And God called that the depths of Satan. Look at Proverbs 5. Proverbs 5. She was leading them to experience something that God had forbidden. Proverbs 5, verse 3, familiar passage. It says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. You know, every once in a while, somebody standing at the crossroads, and they, they just really think about all this. You know, they've heard everything that you've told them. They've heard everything that's been preached. And God says sometimes they just sort of go, is it really all that bad? Are, are, are they making a big deal about nothing? After all, I know so-and-so that did it and so-and-so that did it, and they're, they're really not doing too bad. And, and they start weighing it all out. Look at verse 6. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. It says, just in case you're going to do that, he says. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. He said, you'll never be able to predict what this woman's going to do to you. You'll never predict it. Hear me now, therefore. Okay, so he's going to say, he's saying, let me tell you what to do before you jump in. Listen to my instruction. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children. And depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her. And come not nigh the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others. And thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth. And thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last. That's after all you've experienced. And thou mourn at the last. When thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say. How have I hated instruction? How have I hated what? Instruction. And, if, and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. You know what God's way is? God's way is somebody will come up to you somehow some way somewhere maybe it'll be some old man of god some old woman of god in an old book somewhere 
maybe it'll be on a tape or a or a radio broadcast or a or a YouTube thing. Somebody preaching the word of God, and God will whisper in your ear, and God will say, "I know what you're thinking about. Don't do it." And God's way is, you bow in reverence. And you say, yes, Lord, I will trust you. You know, walking by faith is some people, you know, we often think it's this thing of, well, you know, I'll, I'll give a thousand dollars and put myself in the red and, and trust God. Or, or, you know, that's ridiculous. I realize that. Or, or maybe it's like George Mueller. You, you think that's walking by faith. But boy, there's another aspect of walking by faith. The other aspect of walking by faith is you trust God. Because you haven't experienced. You've been warned and you've been told and you've been warned and you've been told. And, and you haven't seen it play out. And you haven't seen a living example. And faith says, well, this is what the Bible says. I'll just believe what God said and I'll just steer clear. That is walking by faith. Because the other way is called walking by sight, which is experience. So the next time you hear some person say, treat them like adults and they'll act like adults. Let them learn. Okay. You know, be nice. Don't be rude. Don't be ugly. But, but you know what? The next time you hear somebody like that, you hear them say that. Realize either they're extremely ignorant. Or they're lazy and wicked. They are one of the two. There is no other option. The Bible says the flesh is always to be distrusted. Look at Romans 13. We are almost done for tonight. Romans 13. Romans 13. Romans 13, verse 14. Right, before we read that verse, can I, can I give you one more example? Here's, here's what gets, see, and, and again, where this truth is applicable to all of us, okay? But we're, again, we're, we're, we're throwing it out there, especially with the youth in view and with you supervising either your youth or even somebody else's youth, okay? Um, here's, here's how the devil gets young people you know you know you'll hear oh don't do this and it's going to ruin your life and it's going to do all this and instantly the devil points out two or three or four people that did that thing maybe even did it multiple times and and everything's hunky dory and 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 they're fine okay um can I can I can I tell you this and I'm going to give you an, an illustration the devil is a liar and, and there's something about any, any example that the devil holds up in front of you. Um, boy, there is a hidden hook there. And, and you can bank on it. What looks like nobody escapes the wages of their sin. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. Nobody escapes that. So if it looks like they escaped it, it's only an illusion. I picked up a book one day and it was about one of these famous rock stars and pop stars. And uh, he was telling the story of his life. And, um, and he told about how he got hooked on heroin. He said, the first time I took it, he said, I was scared to death. He said, I heard all those stories about, you know, and I remember being in high school, you know, they were in, I went to public school until grade nine. I remember in the eighth grade, they showed us a film on, the various drugs and how they affect you. You know, they thought educating us was going to help us. And so, uh, um, and they, they said, I'll never forget it. They said, there's a certain class of drugs. 
that can be addictive from the first trip. And heroin was one of those. In other words, there are some people that take heroin and man, first trial and they're done like they're hooked. And so this guy said, he said, I had heard that. And he said, I took heroin once. And he said, I woke up the next morning and he said, I was waiting. And he said, I was fine. He said, a few weeks went by and he said, another party, another thing going on. And he said, I took it again. And he said, I waited. And he said, I thought, oh boy, is it going to be this time? He said, I was fine. He said, I did that six or seven or eight times. And he said, nothing happened. And he said, all I can tell you is, and then one morning I woke up and I couldn't live without it. See, he thought, he thought it wasn't going to affect him. And when the devil whispers to you, oh, it'll turn out differently for me. You can bank on it. You're going to get bit and you're going to get bit so bad that in God, unless God rescues you, there will be, there'll be no escape. The best teacher is not experienced. The best teacher is you get on your knees and you open that book. And you say, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Teach me thy statutes, Lord. Teach me. That's, that's what God intended. Let's pray. Lord, it is such a simple truth. Lord, help the parents, help the young people. Lord, help the young adults that have not known the depths of Satan. Lord, may we realize That all you said is true, and Lord, what we have not experienced, may we may we take it by faith. Lord, would you help us? Would you not let us forget this? Would you not let anybody get intimidated into being permissive, Lord, by some foolish statement, Lord? Lord, help us in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if God has spoken to you tonight, why don't you take a minute and just talk to him? Devil's trying to make some of you curious about what's on the other side of the fence. Dinah did that, and she never got over it the rest of her life. You better believe God. You better stay way over in the safe zone. Because that's God's way. Lord, bless this truth in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.